Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for wherever you are around the world. Uh, welcome to the latest webinar um, with today's subject being valve testing. So thanks for everybody that's attended. I really hope that you find that this is informative. OK, so the objective of today's uh, webinar is to provide an overview of the standard testing commonly applied to valves of all the valve types to comply within the valve design standard. Um, we'll then give a o brief overview of the other valve tests that may be specifically applied due to a customer requirement or an end user standard. The intention of this section is to discuss what uh, the testing is, what's involved, is it relevant or applicable, uh, and what's the impact significant in terms of time and cost. Just so that you're aware, if there's any, uh, there will be an opportunity to raise a question. Um, if you wish to submit a question, then please use the Q&A box and we will try and answer uh, those questions raised at the end of the uh, presentation. OK, so a uh, quick introduction from myself. Uh, I'm Graham Ellis. I've over 35 years in the valve industry. I'm the commercial operations director here based in Elland, mainly looking after the sales team. Um, I've uh, got a foundry metallurgy background, um, worked in QA over the years, uh, through to project management, and in my latter years, um, I've been in uh, more of a sales role. Uh, hand over to David, and David will uh, just go through his uh, uh, years in the valve industry. Yep, good morning, everybody. My name's David Shaw. Um, I've worked at Trillium um, just since June this year. Um, and I'm the Control and Isolation Valve Application Manager based in Elland in the UK. Um, I've actually over 25 years experience in the valve industry. I've been started as an apprentice at Hopkinson's, which is now one of the Trillium brands. And most recently I've worked um, in a similar role to the one I have now in applications at a control and choke valve manufacturer within the oil and gas industry. OK, so uh, just before we start, let's just do a quick overview of Trillium Flow Technologies brand portfolio. Our product brand names are synonymous within the pump and valve industries. We have pump brand, brands uh, Bergman, Flowway, Gabionetta, Rotorjet, Wenco, WSP, and the newest addition to the Trillium portfolio, Thermomechanical Pompeii. Um, you'll also see that we have uh, some really good brand names in the valve area. We've got Atwood and Morel for isolation and check valves, Autotorque actuators, Batley butterfly valves, Blakebrook control and choke valves, Hopkinson's parallel slide gates and glow valves, Saracen and Sebin safety valves, and triple offset butterfly valves. Uh, and just recently, um, we've had Redpoint, who's joined the company, uh, and they uh, specialize in exotic alloys with shorter lead times, including um, castings. Um, on the right hand side, on the right hand side, um, you can visualize Trillium's global presence um, with a supply chain that spans the globe. Our key manufacturing and service centers are located in Canada, China, France, India, Italy, South Korea, US, and UK. Globally, we have 19 facilities around the world, plus a global net of sales partners, authorized service centers. Uh, utilizing our global presence enables us to tailor the technical and commercial aspects of our products to suit your project needs. OK, so on this slide, we're showing the long heritage of innovation spanning nearly 200 years. Blake Bravals was established in 1828. And we still manufacture the product here in Elland in the UK, but also globally through our manufacturing facilities in Korea and China. Um, in addition, we are continually adding new products and services to make our customer processes more efficient and productive. As we continue to grow Trillium, we've added in uh, 2021 Redpoint valves to the Trillium family. Uh, and in 2022, um, we uh, increased our acquisition by taking thermomechanical Pompeii within the uh, family of the Trillium Group. Okay, so the topics to be covered today. Um, 
the overview of the standard testings required for valves to comply with the design standard. So we'll be looking at hydrostatic shell tests to ASME B1634. We'll be looking at hydrostatic seat testing to ASME B1634. Seat testing to FCI 70-2 IEC 60534-4 for control valves. Hydrostatic shell testing to API and gas testing to API 6A PSL 3G. So um, we'll also be covering a brief overview of valve testing that may be specifically applied due to customer requirements or, or requested by an end user. It is not intended to delve in any detail, but just to give an awareness of those tests. The idea of this section is just to list what other tests might be called up, uh, why it would be called up, when it's applicable, and on what types of products that they may come up on. Uh, one thing we see a lot of is uh, testing sometimes being called up where really uh, it isn't applicable to the products being offered. Uh, so this is also to give you a bit of an awareness of the tests and products that might be applicable. We do see things like FE testing requirements uh, on valve operating in seawater, etc. So uh, that'll be interesting as we get to that slide. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the question and answer box and uh, we will uh, go through that at the end. So this section we're going to start on is the hydrostatic shell testing of valves. This section applies to all valves that we manufacture apart from the valves manufactured to API 6A. Okay, so hydrostatic shell testing to ASME B1634. So what is the test? Well, the shell test at the gauge pressure no less than one and a half times at 38 degrees rated around and up to the next higher one bar um, is what we generally do on all valves for shell test. Uh, we complete the valve test in an open or partial open position and the test fluid um, is mains water with an inhibitor. It's normally a corrosion inhibitor uh, and will control that chlorine and fluoride content, usually less than 25 parts per million, pH 6 to 8 and an ambient test of 5 to 15 degrees uh, and you mustn't exceed over the 50 degree so why is it done? Well, it's done to ensure that we have a structural integral valve to check for leaks through the casting wall, to check for leaks through um, gasket joints such as uh, body bonnet joints and deliberately over pressurizing the product beyond its working pressure to provide confidence in this pressure boundary of the valve. OK, so. What equipment is needed? So obviously, um, starting, we need test equipment. There are many ways of designing this, and it all depends on the product that you're trying to test and the volume of the identical product being manufactured uh, with a name to be as efficient as possible. So the image on the left is how we test most of our valves here in Elland, UK, in a hydraulic press, either high, horizontal or vertical. This allows quick changeover of valves without the need to bolt on the individual test flanges, which is very time consuming, especially on larger valves or higher pressure valves. Using multiple O-ring plates allows multiple valve sizes to be tested with the same test equipment. One point to note that there is uh, that the clamping load just balances out the forces of the test fluid and isn't required to apply a sealing load. The way O-rings work is to use fluid pressure to make the seal rather than applied load, which would be in the case of a spiral wound gasket. Even so, on book weld valves, we manufacture special rings to take the load to prevent um, to the book weld profile being damaged. Angle valves generally need flange uh, bolts on and hubs have to be tested with mating clamps to ensure that the whole system will be sealed with no dimensional issues. OK. OK, so uh, we've got a number of images on here. This is uh, the capability uh, of uh, Trillium. Um, it also gives you a good understanding of what the Ellen facility is able to do as a testing capability. 
um, you will see that um, we can hydro test between the quarter MPT up to 36 inch gate and control valves, up to 42 inch swing check valves, three inch up to 102 inch butterfly valves. And then for API, we do one and 13 sixteenths up to 21 and a quarter uh, API 6A 10K. And we can really go up to pressures over 22 and a half thousand PSI. So we're well covering API 15K. We also have facilities to uh, do gas testing on site and we can uh, cover the 1 and 13 16 up to 7 and 16 um, API 10K and pressures up to 16 and a half thousand. Again, that covers the 15K. Um, what you see in the images there are uh, 36 inch class 300 control valve. We've also uh, manufactured 36 inch uh, 600 class gate valves and up to 2.6 meter uh, butterfly valves. API valves tend to be choke valves that we deal with and they generally are in the range of four to eight inch. Uh, we have manufactured chokes and API rated control valves much larger up to 12 and 16 inch range. Um, and we have partners available uh, within our group that can, uh, can gas test even larger API valves. So what equipment is needed? So a modern test facility is usually fully enclosed with uh, pneumatic operated doors featuring interlocks so pumps cannot run until the door is closed. That's obviously done for safety because we're, lit, we're dealing with high pressures and uh, safety is paramount to all our employees. Um, you can see from the images that we have there um, that there is a steel enclosure. There is a steel roof with um, added retractable slots for the crane to go in and lift valves in and out. We have automatic doors um, and all the equipment is operated from outside to ensure that uh, para, uh, safety is paramount. Um, you can also see in those images that we have um, remote control 4K cameras. And this is really a benefit over the last few years where we can offer remote inspection uh, to our customers or third party inspectors. Um, so they can see that at any time around the world. We can also, um, also provide video and chart recordings of any uh, of the tests that, come, uh, that get uh, required to be seen with that evidence. Um, on the left, um, you can see the valve, the left picture on the left, you can see the valve in the test bay. You can see the cameras and the vent on top uh, test plate to vent off to air. The center picture um, outside the test bay before the doors are closed, you can see the valve set up and on the screen at the same time, just that little screen that you can see on the left hand side. And on the right, um, you can see the valve in the test bay doors closed and uh, you can see the joystick for the camera and the PLC controller that controls the doors and the pumps and the pressure transmitters. So I'm now going to hand over to David, who's going to go a little bit more now technical on uh, the rest of the information on testing. Yep, so the hydrostatic um, shell test pressure. This this is a question that will get asked quite uh, a bit from our customers, or it actually gets questioned uh, why we've arrived at the test pressure we have. Um, quite often, the conception is that if a customer provides a design pressure of the valve on the their valve data sheet, then the test pressure will be one and a half times the design pressure. But what we actually have to do is work to the standard. And in this case, the standard being B1634. Um, to arrive at the test pressure, what we actually have to do is look at the pressure temperature ratings uh, within B1634. And what B1634 has is these tables in the bottom left of the screen. And it groups together uh, materials with similar yield strengths. Um, so there's a tip, um, numerous tables in there for different groups of material. And what it does, it gives you a maximum operating pressure at the different temperatures. Um, so on 
on the example we've got here, you can see there's an operating pressure um, all the way from um, 38 degrees C all the way in 50 degree increments all the way up to 538 degrees C. So what we use for the test pressure is what we call the cold rated design pressure. And we've highlighted that in red there. So for a class 600 valve, the cold rated design pressure um, of a valve in this material group would be 102.1 bar G. Um, so that's the basis of the test pressure. What we do then is we multiply that by 1.5 to give you 153.15 bar G. And then you round that up to the nearest whole number. So the test pressure for this valve would be 154 bar G. Um, and again, the standard gives you minimum durations um, for the valve tests. So as you can see, the larger the valve, the longer the duration. Um, many valve manufacturers actually test for longer than this as standard. Um, and the reason for this is if you've got a very th thick wall section on your casting, it can take a long time for any leakage to permeate through the wall. Um, so obviously, the bigger the valve, the longer the duration of the test. So what if a valve fails the standard testing that we do? Um, we've categorized this into a number of possible failures, um, um, but there could be others. So if you had a leakage through the casting, it, just to point out that this is actually very rare these days, you know, the quality of the castings we get is very good. And there's usually a requirement to carry out NDE on the casting. So that would pick any pick up any defects prior to um, even finishing the manufacturing process. Um, but if we did get a through wall defect or any leakage through the casting, it would obviously require a weld repair. And we have weld repair procedures for all the materials that we manufacture. Um, now what we do at this stage is we'd usually consult with the customer um, and submit the weld procedure for acceptance. Um, and what we'd also do is refer to any project specifications to see if there's any extra testing that might be required. So there might be requirements on certain materials to perform corrosion testing on the weld, or um, there might be a requirement to do additional post-weld heat treatment. Um, and all that's um, conducted, uh, you know, through our quality department and through our casting and, and weld repair providers. Um, leakage through gaskets and other potential um, failure points. Uh, what we tend to see is if there are any leakage through the gaskets, it's generally down to some sort of misalignment in assembly rather than any design issue. So this can usually be rectified fairly um, simply by um, reworking the valve, um, just ensuring that everything's been properly tightened up to the correct procedures. Um, in the third potential leakage you might see if you were witnessing a valve on hydro test is leakage through the packings. Um, so it's important to note that B1634 isn't actually requiring the packings to um, maintain the leak tightness against the hydrostatic test pressure at one and a half times. Um, what they actually have to um, stop leakage against is at 1.1 1, 1 times the cold rate of design pressure. So if you see any packing leakage at one and a half times, we reduce the pressure down to 1.1 and then simply tighten the packings till the leaking stops. So it's important not to over tighten the packing because you're increasing the friction, frictional load on the valve when it's operating. So what does a customer see in terms of results? Um, so when we carry out the test, we're... Uh, monitoring for leakage on the cameras that we have uh, focused on the valve. And we're also monitoring the pressure gauges for any drop in pressure. So generally, providing there's no drop in pressure on the gauge, then there's not going to be any leakage. And if you do get a drop in pressure, then sometimes it's uh, an issue with the test equipment rather than the valve itself. 
So that that's the point where you'd investigate um, and do a, a close inspection of the valve. And all the results are recorded within our internal system and a 3.1 cert is issued. Um, the 3.1 cert is usually signed and stamped internally to ensure traceability. And also we obviously offer the opportunity for customers and third parties to witness um, all the tests that we do on the valves within our facilities. Um, just to point out that there are other standards that cover hydrostatic testing as listed below. Um, mostly if you cover one standard, it covers them all. But obviously this is uh, determined by the customer's specification. Then our procedures uh, updated accordingly to, to what is required by the particular customer. So hydrostatic closure testing to be 1634. Um, again, this covers the isolation valve ranges that we manufacture within Trillium. It doesn't cover um, the control valves or any type of valves with a, an allowable leakage. They're covered by other standards. So why do we do hydrostatic closure test? It's to ensure the valve can isolate against the design pressure. Um, the closure test is at 1.1 times the um, cold rated design pressure at 38 degrees C. The testing will normally be done immediately after the shell test. So it's all done in one process really to um, make the process more efficient. So you're only having to uh, pressurize and fill the valve once. It's important to note that dual direction valves such as gate valves are tested in both directions. Uh, the gland is checked at the same time as the seat test is done. And it's also important to note that B1634 does not cover any allowable leakage rates. Um, so in a lot of cases for isolation valves, other standards are referred at this point, API 598 or MSS SP61, which um, do give a, a small leakage allowance on isolation valves. So the next, next test is seat testing to FCI 70-2 um, or the equivalent um, standard IEC 60534-4. Now this testing is applicable to all control products. So within our range, we have globe valves, uh, choke valves would also be covered by this test and a butterfly valve if it's been used in a control application rather than an isolation application. So anybody that's familiar with leakage rates on control valves um, knows the various leakage rates from class two up to class six. Um, so the higher the leakage uh, class designation, the lower the allowable amount of leakage. Um, just to put some context on that, uh, within our range, we have what we call a swing through butterfly valve, which is um, a very basic type of control valve. And this valve actually has um, a circumferential gap between the disc and the body. Um, it's a, probably about a millimeter or a millimeter and a half gap all the way around the, the disc. So obviously this is going to have quite a high uh, leakage. And um, this type of valve is designated as a class two, which approximates to 0.5% of the valve capacitor. Now with the, this type of valve, because the allowable leakage is so high, we wouldn't generally test it. Um, it's it proven really by calculation rather than physical testing because you wouldn't actually be able to generate enough flow in the test pumps um, to measure the leakage. Um, and then we go up to a class three, which is 0.1% of valve capacitor. And probably the most common leakage rate is class four, which is 0.01% of valve capacitor. Now this test is um, conducted with water or air at four bar G. And the next most uh, severe um, leakage class is class five. This is generally specified for metal to metal seating. 
and it's it's commonly referred as a as a tight shut off within the industry. And the main difference here is that this um, leakage class is actually tested at the service DP, so the full differential that the valve will see in the closed position, which obviously makes it a more onerous test to to pass. And um, generally in this leakage class, you're having to do more lapping of plugs and seats to, to achieve the required shutoff. And the final one is a class six. Um, um, the difference here, again, this is tested on air as the test medium. Um, it's tested at a, a fairly low pressure of 50 PSI or 60 PSI. And what we're measuring here is bubbles per minute rather than cc's per minute. So we're actually counting the number of bubbles um, and going to a one inch valve, you can see that you're allowed one bubble per minute of leakage. So again, this is a, an onerous test and usually PTFE inserts are used in the valve design to achieve this. So you wouldn't really offer a class six valve in a severe service because your PTFE insert would um, run the risk of getting damaged. <clears throat> so hydrostatic shell testing to API 6A. Um, for the valves we do here at Ellen, this applies to choke valves in, in the main. Um, but within other um, companies within Trillium, we have uh, API 6I ball valves, which will be tested in a similar manner. So the actual testing itself is similar to the B1634 shell test. It's it's done for the same reasons. Um, the test pressure now is 1.1 times the rated pressure. It's a bit more, a bit simpler to apply this on um, API rated products because you don't have the different material groups and you're generally not dealing with elevated pressures, so uh, elevated temperatures. So an API 10K rated valve, for example, is tested at 15,000 PSI, uh, regardless of the material. Um, and the main difference between B1634 and the API 6A testing is that we actually conduct two distinct um, hydro tests. Um, so the valve is initially pressurized and held at the test pressure for an initial holding period of three minutes then the pressure is reduced back down to zero. And then the valve is pressurized for a second time um, for either three minutes or 15 minutes, depending on the PSL level specified for the valve. And for a PSL three or a PSL four valve, a chart recorder is used, um, which is the image in the center. And this chart recording just provides additional traceability of the testing. Um, so the PSL levels in API, um, just to give a quick summary, um, they range from PSL1 to PSL4. And again, the higher the PSL number, the higher the, um, the level of testing, the higher the level of NDE, and the higher the level of traceability required. And the reason for this is um, the service that the valve has been installed on. So. A low pressure water valve, for example, would have a PSL1 going through to a PSL4, which would be a very high pressure valve operating on a hydrocarbon gas, um, usually a sour gas for a PSL4. And, um, you know, that would have a high hydrogen sulfide content. So you need the additional traceability. So gas testing to API 6A PSL 3G. This is um, quite commonly applied on choke valves that are operating in hydrocarbon gas. Um, the, the PSL level should really be determined by the customer and advised to the supplier within the um, inquiry and tender documents. So when we're doing a gas test on API products, we test them at 1.1 times the design pressure. Um, an important point to note is that any valve um, undergoing gas, gas testing, whether it's an API valve or uh, any 
design standards should always have undergone the hydrostatic test first at 1.15 times the design pressure. That's so you you know for sure that the valve has the required structural integrity. Um, again, this is um, a, a safety requirement. And what we do on the gas testing is we actually have a, a tank and we fully submerge the valve within the tank. Um, again, we're, we're monitoring the valve um, with the cameras. And what we're looking for here is any visible leakage. Um, I think these the the word from the API standard. There should be no visible leakage in the form of bubbles for the entire holding period. And you can see on the right there um, one of our API design valves within the tank. And again, you can see that this is monitored um, by the CCTV. And you can also see on the image at the bottom there the chart recording. Um, recording the test pressure for the duration of the test. Again, this um, is then submitted at the end of the project as part of the documentation. So optional special testing, um, we've just, we're have just we just covering a few today. The, there are numerous additional tests that can be done on valves. Again, depending on what industry they're being used in. Um, so these may do differ in the oil and gas industry to the power industry or the nuclear industry. Um, and again, these are usually specified by the customer or within the project specifications. Um, so we're just going th through some of the more common ones that were requested today. So the first one is flow testing to IEC 60534-2-3. Um, also called capacity testing in some cases. And what we're trying to achieve with this test is ensuring that the capacity of the valve is um, within the capacity against the, um, the real technical documents. Um, the valve is tested on using a flow meter. And there's two versions of this really. You, Sometimes it's only required to know the fully open um, capacity. So that just gives you one value. Or in some cases, customers may want to know the exact characteristic of the valve. And in this case, we can conduct the same test, but at 10% increments of opening. So you get a nice accurate um, characteristic curve that can be used in the future. Now, the main reason you do this test is if there's some safety element uh, linked to the capacity of the control valve. So this may be safety relief valves um, have been sized based on the maximum flow that can pass through the control valve. So it may be a requirement to um, actually check the capacitor um, to ensure the safety relief valves are correctly sized. Or on the flip side of this, you may want to ensure a minimum flow is achievable through the valve. This is on um, applications such as an anti-surge valve where you need to make sure that the valve will pass enough flow to protect your um, compressors or your capital equipment. Um, the next testing we're going to talk about is fugitive emissions. Again, within the oil and gas industry, and we're now seeing within the hydrogen in industry, this is becoming a um, more and more common requirement as we're trying to reduce emissions. Um, now this type of testing or this standard has two parts. Uh, part one, um, you'll hear referred to as a prototype test, and then a, a part two test you'll hear referred to as a production test, uh, quite often called a sniffer test within the industry. So this is typically applied in the oil and gas industry for valves in hydrocarbon service, um, especially valves operating on hydrocarbon gas. Um, it shouldn't really be applicable to other services within the oil and gas industry like seawater, nitrogen or, or glycol. Um, but it can be specified quite often on produced water services. 
um, because produced water will contain traces of hydrocarbon, whether that's um, in a liquid or a gas form. So you quite often see it specified on produced water. Um, there are two parts to the ISO 15848. So going on to the prototype or type testing, um, this the intention of this uh, part of the standard is to qualify a range of valves rather than be used on a production valve. And there are three leakage rates um, designations within there, the A, B, and C, with B probably being the more common one to use. And you can conduct the test with both helium, which is has a H designation, or methane with an M designation. And you can see below the allowable leakage rates for each of those based on helium. And there's also a note in the standard there that class A is really um, intended to be achieved with the bellows type valve. So the second criteria of the prototype testing is the endurance classes. This is um, categorized into control valves and isolation valves. So control valves, you have CC1, which is 20,000 cycles, being the more common one. And on isolation valves, um, CO1, the valves required to um, achieve a full travel um, of 500 cycles before it can be qualified. Um, and the important point there is that the qualification is scalable to other valves within the same range. Um, the candidate valve would have to have a stem size between half of the qualified stem size or two times the qualified stem size. It would have to have a pressure class lower than the qualified valve and the design temperature would have to be within the um, design temperatures that the qualified valve has been um, tested to. So another point there, the CC1 endurance class is at both the maximum and the minimum design temperature. So generally, most valves that have undergone this um, type of testing have, have gone through 40,000 cycles to get the qualification, which you can imagine is very time consuming and um, potentially costly as well for the, the manufacturer. Um, so if a valve has been sold as um, qualified um, to a, an existing prototype test, it should have a certificate. Um, you can see on the left hand side there the minimum information that you'd need on the, the certificate in order to um, qualify a valve by its prototype test. And then the production valve can be marked um, what we call ISO FE. And there's a full codification there of the marking that the valve would receive. Um, just to quickly go through this, the ISO FE is a standard text. Then the next letter across is the tightness class, so A, B, or C. In this case, it's B. The next letter would be the test medium, so either H for helium or M for methane. The next section of the code is endurance class. So CC1 in this case, this is how many cycles the valve's undergone. The next section is the stem seal adjustments. So SSA1 uh, indicates that the valve um, underwent one stem seal adjustment throughout the entire uh, testing regime. The next part is the maximum and minif minimum qualified temperatures that the valve has undergone. Um, the next part on there is the pressure class rating of the valve that underwent the testing, uh, along with the design pressure. So you can see here on the uh, top section, the class 1500 valve design pressure was 259 bar, but it was tested at 243 bar. That's because it was tested at 200 degrees C. So that refers back to your B1634 pressure temperature tables again. Um, and the next part is just the standard that the valve is qualified to. Um, just uh, another point on the certificate. Um, 
it would generally be expected that that certificate would be stamped, witnessed and authorised by a, a reputable uh, witness inspection authority. And then once you've done the prototype and you are manufacturing valves to the prototype design, you can then do what's called a, a part two production test or a sniffer test. Now, this test is a, a much simpler test. You're only testing the valve at six bar G um, and you're using helium within the test gas and a mass spectrometer to detect any leakage. Um, so this type of test should only be conducted once the valve has already un undergone a, a prototype test. This is just to ensure there's no issues with the manufacturing process or the assembly process. And the, the last test that we're going to cover is API 6A PR2F testing to Annex F of API 6A. Um, this is not a mandatory test within API 6A. It's really on the customer's um, or the specifications requirement, whether they want it for a particular service. Um, it is quite a demanding test because again, it involves um, cycling of pressure and temperature at the maximum and minimum design temperatures. Um, so quite often a, a valve is never actually going to operate anywhere near its maximum or, or minimum design temperatures. So that, that makes it quite an onerous testing to undergo. Um, again, though, once a valve is qualified, it's scalable to other designs. Um, the, the candidate valve would have to be either one size up or one size down from the tested valve. So it's possible to test PR2 qualify a full range of valves by testing um, relatively few amounts of valves. Um, and even if the valve is covered by a PR2F qualification, we generally then do the PR1 test as a factory acceptance test. Um, again, the PR1 test is, is nowhere near as severe as the PR2 test. David, um, thank you for that. That was very informative. Um, it's time for questions. Um, we've had a number of questions come through. Um, if I'll just read them out and see if uh, if you can answer them, Dave. So um, uh, on the spot. <laughs> yeah. So um, okay. So is the test pressure the same for standard and special class? Um, this depends entirely on the material group within B1634. A lot of material groups have the same uh, design pressure at the cold rated um, temperature um, for both special and standard class. So they would get the same test pressure, but certain materials have a, a higher design pressure. Um, so the special class... In, in most cases, it gives you more benefit at higher uh, operating temperature than actually at the cold rate of pressure. Okay, thank you. Um, oh. We've been asked, um, do we actually do any uh, testing to API 598? Um, I think we will within Trillium. Um, I think more on the ball valve side. Is that right, Dave? Yeah, I think probably more on, on the ball valve type. Um, and possibly on the the larger swing checks that we do in the USA. Um, within the UK products, we actually aim for zero leakage on our isolation products, which is um, better than what is specified in API 598. Okay. Um, we've had a question about uh, what cold rated pressure. I guess that's cold working pressure. Um do we do we have a, an understanding? I mean, we talked about it. Um, to me, it's the maximum pressure rating at the temperatures between minus twenty F and a, to one hundred degrees F. Is that your interpretation? Yeah, th that's it. It's the um, basically the, the top line within the pressure temperature ratings in B sixteen thirty four. Um, yes, I think it was up to 38, 38 degrees C. Yeah. Which, yeah. Um, have we any involvement with classification um, inspectorates with DNV, ABS, Lloyds? 
Yep. So on FPSO projects, um, these authorities usually get involved um, because they're actually certifying and ensuring the the vessel itself. Um, it tends to be more related to valves that are related to the operating of the vessel rather than um, the oil production valves. So you tend to see it more on valves related to ballast or um, that kind of um, that kind of application on the FPSO. But we we have seen requirements on some of our um, production valves that we do as well. Um, all of these standards have, have quite different requirements. So it can be anything from a, a design review. So you'd have to submit the design calculations for approval. It can be witness testing of the valves. And in some cases, all they want to do is look at the test certs at the end of a job and sign and stamp them off. So it would really be at the beginning of the project where the authority would define what their level of involvement in the project is going to be. But certainly we've uh, dealt with all of these uh, authorities before on FPSO projects. Okay, we've had a, a great question coming in, just asking if we know the validity of an FE prototype test. I would have to say off the, off the top of my head, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's sometimes you see that it's uh, wrote in that uh, you have to do a, a renewal. Yeah, a renewal, yeah. Customer, customer specification on what they accept. Um, so uh, what about, uh, we've got a question asking about, is it possible to test more than one valve at once? Um, yes, so uh, probably more on a commodity type product, um, like a rubber line butterfly valve or a, a low pressure ball valve. Um, you can actually test the valves in a, like daisy chain them in a, in a sequence. Um, the benefit obviously is you've only got one um, you can test multiple at the same time, so it's saving time in your production. But the drawback is if you have a failure of one valve in that chain, then you've basically invalidated the test for all of the valves, so you'd have to test them all again. But it is possible. Okay, and we've got a last-minute question just coming in asking about uh, do we have the facility to check self-operated pressure control valves uh, with pneumatic air? Um, that's not what we uh, tend to do here in, in Elland uh, on self-operated uh, pressure control valves. Um, there was a second part question. Uh, <laughs> do you have a facility to test with nitrogen? You can probably answer that one, Dave. Yeah, yeah. We uh, uh, The gas testing that we do is, is usually with, with nitrogen, yes. Yeah, and then sometimes it's 97% it's uh, nitrogen with three percent helium so you can detect any leakage using the mass spectrometer okay and we've got another question that's just come in regarding um have we an idea of what the minimum test duration may be and maybe what the maximum would be on a valve uh yeah so i, th I think this was covered in one of the slides um so according to b1634 a two inch valve the minimum test duration is 15 seconds but i think as a standard we we actually do it for three minutes regardless of the size um and again in the standard the maximum duration is 300 seconds uh, for a valve 14 inch or above um again i think we test for longer than that and quite often you see uh some customers where they've had failures on site, they'll ask for a, a one hour minimum duration. Um, so customers sometimes override what's in the specification and we, we can accommodate for that. Um, again, it's just to, to give them extra assurance that they're not going to get leakage. Okay. And we'll just take one last question just as we're getting to the hour. Um, we've had a question asked about, is it possible to upgrade an old valve to meet a fugitive emissions requirement? Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, I think technically the answer is yes, but you, 
Um, you would have to conduct some testing on it as well, really, which is probably more of a factory-based activity than a field-based activity if you were to do the um, the part two sniffer test on it again. But certainly you could replace the the design of the original packings with a, an upgraded packing that um, that's qualified by your uh, part one testing. And again, you'd have to make sure of the condition of the stem and the actual bar of the packing um, on the bonnet just to make sure that they're in good condition before you could commit to it. Okay, thank you. We've just hit the hour, so uh, thank you very much for joining. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, David, for giving us an insight into the valve testing. Uh, we'll close now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for everybody that joined.